Good afternoon, everybody. We will wait a couple more seconds to see if, in fact, we have some more people joining us. But on behalf of David, Breen, and myself, we are, we are very happy that you all chose to take some time out of your afternoon to join us today. Um, some of you know that at one point last year, we were doing what we call a brewery series. Um, and we would like to be doing that again. But for the most part, we would all either be quarantining someplace or um, what can I say? So if those of you who are not in the office, if you'd like to go grab a beverage, feel free to do so. So some housekeeping uh, items before we kick this off. Um, you will receive CPE credit for both sessions of this. Um, what you need to do is answer the polling questions as we go through. Also at the end, there is a survey, so please, please take the survey. That's key to, the, um, to getting the CPE credit. And you will get a certificate from us in probably the next two to, two to four weeks showing that you, you're, you, you've gotten the credit. So only, if you gave us, only if you gave us all tens. <laughs> only, 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 yeah, only, true, Breen's right. Only if you give us tens will you get, will you get uh, your CPE. We yeah. have two topics today. Uh, the first one is the state tax implications of TCJA and the CARES Act. And the second one deals with sales tax. It's sales tax traps and M&A and what we are now dealing with in uncertain times. So with that, I'm going to kick it over to David and he's going to start. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. So with this first session, as Marilyn just talked about, we are going to talk about the recent changes to the TCGA and also the CARES Act and just what that means from a state tax perspective. Uh, most of us that are on this call likely know that uh, with the feds, there's one jurisdiction and federal tax professionals only have to deal with that one jurisdiction. But as state practitioners, we have to deal with the state and what the federal impact means uh, from a state perspective and what it may not mean at all. So um, with that, we're just gonna talk about some of the changes for, uh, on TCGA uh, and also the CARES Act, uh, particularly with an emphasis on, on the corporate income tax issues that arise from that, and then uh, how the states are reacting, if they've reacted at all. As many of us know, uh, they haven't even uh, put out uh, uh, positions on each of the changes. So it's kind of a, uh, a, a, an evolving door and in, in what changes have been adopted and have not. So. Uh, specifically with this section, we're going to talk about state tax conformity issues to the, to the IRC and what that means. We'll provide a CARES Act overview, and then we'll touch on some of the key TCGA uh, uh, provisions, particularly from a state tax or exclusively from a state tax perspective. Uh, and then within that, we will talk about the taxation of foreign source income, the business in interest expense limitations, and then lastly, uh, touch on what the net operating losses uh, impact is, if any, from a state perspective. So before we get started with the state conformity to the IRC, we are going to start with uh, some polling questions, as, as Marilyn suggested. One thing to note, I believe this is true, Marilyn and Breen can correct me if I'm wrong, but those of you who are accessing this presentation on an app, uh, maybe with an Apple phone or a or a droid, they, you may have issues viewing the polling questions, but don't worry if that is a problem, contact us after the fact. We will get you those polling questions to ensure that you get credit for uh, CLE purposes. So polling question. Uh, first question, what keeps you up at night? And here we have the possibility of e-learning for the 2021 school year. I know Breen and I are, are going through that. There will be no professional or college football in the fall. Uh, many of us may have a, a, a opinion on that. Managing the state tax function remotely. Uh, those are people that state tax is just in our blood and we can't, can't get away. Or D, all of the above. We still got some votes trickling in. I can see the preliminary results. It's going to be a close one. Any guesses, Marilyn Breen? Oh, well, I'm going to go with e-learning because that's what that's what it's on my mind. All right, and polling. 
share results. It's a close one, but it looks like we have some football fans mixed with some tax professionals that are struggling between those two issues that we're going to face. Uh, for Breen and I, we didn't vote, but we're with those uh, three people that, that are uh, <laughs> with the possibility of e-learning. Apparently people like their children home with them. <laughs> All right, let me close out of this. So with this, let's move on to some of the substance now. So when we talk about conformity, uh, as I just mentioned, you know, states don't always react the same way uh, or that they react differently to changes that at the feds, uh, changes made to the fed level. So when we look at the three types of conformity, we have rolling, fixed and selective. And when we look at rolling, rolling about half of the states have rolling conformity. And what that means is that these states will automatically implement the federal changes as it's enacted, unless the states take a position that they are decoupling from a, a, a specific provision. Um, when we look at this approach, this, this probably provides the best clarity and predictability for taxpayers. There is almost a bar that's been set that they know how their state's gonna adjust to some of these changes. Uh, you know, Compare that with the other two with fixed and static. Uh, so a fixed, date conformity is, is again, it's going to incorporate wholesale changes of the federal tax code, uh, but it's going to identify those specific provisions. And that means, uh, or it's going to identify them as of a specific date. Um, deliberate action must be taken to adopt those uh, provisions. And some states, while uh, active in this approach and that they, they regularly bring up these issues in legislative sessions so you know when they are going to rule on it. Other states, their legislative sessions aren't particularly active, especially when it comes to tax provisions. So there's uh, not a, a clear guidance on whether a state is going to adapt a, a specific section. And then the, the, the last uh, bit of conformity is uh, selective conformity. And that's where uh, the states, there's only a handful of states um, of note of, of the participants, Arkansas fits in this category. Uh, they adopt specific federal provisions by reference, but it, uh, omit a large section of the, the federal changes. So there you're, you're reading through the code, looking to see where in fact the state legislations adopted a specific federal, federal code provision. Um, now, one of the things that we talked about, even in spite of these three types of conformity, states can decouple from, from particular uh, provisions. And so one of the notes that I, I wanted to mention today is, is Maryland's decoupling uh, in light of the CARES Act. So Maryland has a decoupling provision as an example where they are on a rolling basis, but they have a decoupling position that says, if the decoupling is going to result in a potential impact of a, of a $5 million uh, loss in revenue to the state, then the comptroller has to take a closer look at this provision, look at the impact, and basically draft a memorandum with its results um, to see if this, if this impact would uh, encompass the $5 million. Now, typically, this decoupling provision isn't in effect because what happens is the feds will change a law, but they'll say this is effective the following tax year. And so the, the states have some time to react to this or in Maryland's case, uh, this provision wouldn't be prompted. But this provision specifically says if the feds are going to enact something and implement it in the current calendar year that has a $5 million tax uh, uh, revenue deficit, then the comptroller needs to act on it and give an opinion of whether they are gonna conform or decouple to this. So uh, particularly with what we'll get into later, uh, the comptroller of Maryland has opined on the CARES Act and specifically it decoupled from the 163J, the business interest expense deduction and the net operating loss changes that will all be uh, discussed later today. Um, yeah, and just to add a little bit before we jump into the CARES Act, what's, what's interesting to me, David, about you bringing up the, that Maryland, um, the, the, the Maryland's ability to do that is specifically because the CARES Act was actually, the intent of it was to actually create more um, li liquidity amongst taxpayers and you know help uh, stabilize the economy. And so, I mean, you would think that it would actually be um, more beneficial for the state not to decouple. I mean, 163J, Maryland's gonna get into the nuts and bolts of that. So that's a, you know its own animal, but uh, 
effectively, you know, the CARES Act was supposed to be helpful in that helping to stabilize the economy right now in the difficult times that we're facing. Um, another, an, another point I wanted to mention about conformity that is really important, particularly when we're looking at the CARES Act, when you're dealing with states that are rolling versus fixed, um, the interplay with the CARES Act and the TCH, TCJA conformity um, comes really comes into play because you know if you're a rolling if you're rolling conformity if you're a state that has rolling conformity then you're automatically going to adopt the CARES Act modifications um, that were or the the modifications that are made to TCJA provisions um, put forth through the CARES Act opposed to a fixed state conformity if you're a state um, that has a fixed state conformity and say you know your date certain was post TCJA, then without that proactive measure on your behalf, you're not going to adopt those favorable um, taxpayer provisions that the CARES Act puts forth. Um, and that is, especially given the timing of everything, you know, states would have to, to David's point, act fairly quickly in order to then adopt it if you're a fixed state state conformity state to adopt the CARES Act at the state level and having to look through everything and you in Maryland I'm sure is going to go into this a little bit more but you know just to give an illustrative example um, if it is if you are a fixed state state a fixed date state say that five times fast um, and you have a conformity date of post TCJA um, the difference could be like when looking at the 163J business deduction, interest deduction, um, states with rolling conformity are going to adopt that provision, the changes made to 163JA on a automatically, they're going to adopt that and you're going to end up, you know, taxpayers are going to have the benefit of that higher 50% cap and the ability to use the 2019 adjusted taxable income um, for 2020. Um, both very beneficial, opposed to fixed state states where you're going to still be under the TCJ um, parameters of um, the lower cap, the 30%, and um, being uh, having to having to use the 2020 adjusted taxable your ATI, your 2020 ATI, which, given what has happened in the business community, um, particularly for higher hit uh, industries such as like hospitality or retail you're going to see, you know, that's going that that could have large long lasting ramifications. Also on the rolling conformity states, because when CARES Act was enacted, and we'll talk more about the CARES Act in a minute here, Breen's going to do that, what was enacted, it was enacted in late March, and a lot of legislat state legislatures were either in hiatus because of COVID-19, or were working their way out of being in session. Um, as, and as a result of that, they may not have had the opportunity to make a determination as to whether or not they were going to decouple from the CARES Act, because there's some other points of the CARES Act with net operating losses, and we will get into 163J, that, that could impact state revenue differently than what it was aimed at doing at the federal level. Yeah, and what you're going to see, you know, what we've seen come down recently in some states, it was either... Um, either George, it might have been Georgia recently, it was Georgia or it might have been Georgia. Um, it just came down recently that they adopt, they just adopted and decoupled from certain provisions and they made it, uh, they made it effective as of um, January 1st, 2019. So what you have to then do, I think it was Georgia that, um, that decoupled from guilty. And so what you, what they're going to end up having to do, taxpayers are going to have to go back and file amended returns for 2019. So um, you're going to, you know, specifically if you have states that are still going to be looking at that, there's a large, there's a, a very distinct possibility that that could end up being um, the outcome is that we're gonna, you're going to have a lot of amended returns. And then if you get into the, if you really get into the nitty gritty of looking at, you know, if they're adopting that, if they don't decouple, if they adopt it fully, and you're looking at the different NOLs, okay, well, like, what happens there, right? Under under the CARES Act, you have the ability to carry back NOLs that you didn't under TCJA. So is that also going to potentially reduce the guilty that you that you have used or um, in prior years? Is that going to affect your how you reported guilty or tax credits used? And if, as a reminder, under TCJA, you can't carry forward those tax credits, those foreign tax credits. So, you know, the interplay between the CARES Act and TCJA has um, can get pretty meaty in some aspects of it, especially looking at like what what provisions are being adopted um, is particularly when you're looking at the NOLs and then the ramifications at the state level of what happens with state returns um, 
particularly I think when you're when you're looking at the utilization of the NOLs, the beneficial NOL rules that have come out. So we want to move to the next slide, David. Okay. Okay, so the CARES Act, so the Coronavirus Aid Relief and Economic Security Act. Most of the act was aimed at stabilizing the national economy. However, you know, so when you're looking at the PPP that was issued that, um, you know, more that you've been reading and, you know, pretty much that's been on the news every day or in the, in the times that we're reading. Um, however, there were several significant corporate tax relief provisions um, that have implications for corporate income tax, particularly the in, also the interplay that they have with the TCJA. Um, the three major ones, two of them that we will cover today is um, one, the changes in the limitations that I mentioned on the business interest um, deduction, um, expense deductions under 163J um, that provide for a higher cap in 2019 and 2020. And again, Marilyn's going to get into more of the specifics of that. Um, but, you know, the over uh, high, high arching is that the overview is that it increases from a 30% to 50%. Um, interest expense deduction, and also, um, I believe, gives you the ability to uh, use uh, your 2019 ATI opposed to 2020. Um, there's changes in the NOL rules that I just mentioned that provide the carryback of losses, um, uh, specifically losses generated in 2018, 2019, and 2020 um, that were not available. That you know, the NOL. If any of you familiar with the TCJ, the, and uh, that that did not provide for the carryback of NOLs. Um, and then also one, one item that we're not going to get into in too much detail, but the 168K, um, the reclassification of qualified improvement property to make it eligible for the 100% bonus depreciation or essentially the depreciation schedule. Really what um, the CARES Act does is it corrects I believe what you could call almost like a mistake in the TCJA that had provide for um, a, a much longer depreciation life for a certain property. It was like 39 years. So effectively, you know, reducing the ability to use it at all. And so what this does is it shortens it to a 15 year um, depreciation lifespan. David, okay. Um, so again, one thing I do want to mention too that's really important, I believe, is that all of the fixes, if you want to call that, under the CARES Act are all really just like a matter of a, a matter of timing. Um, they're only affecting when a taxpayer um, pays the tax, not whether they're going to pay the tax. Um, so all these provisions are really just a matter of timing, and they don't involve, like, you know, they don't involve rate reduction. They don't involve tax cuts. The purpose of this was to free up cash to help remain, um, help sustain the vi our viable economic markets in the middle of the pandemic and help businesses survive um, until after this pandemic ends. So I think just keeping in mind that this is, um, a lot of this is a matter of timing and not necessarily changing that, what the taxpayer is going to pay. It's just a matter of when the taxpayer is required to pay it. So again, we have seen some states begin to address the implication of the CARES Act. Colorado, I mean, these states, th this slide just kind of goes into some of the specifics. Um, you, we do have, you know, I think you're going to see, a, we're going to see a lot of interplay of the NOL issue at the state level because there's a lot of states that don't um, straight adopt the federal NOL rules. Um, so for instance, Colorado reverses the NOL deduction and caps it at 400K. Um, Iowa decoupled from 163J and allows a deduction for guilty. You know, and when you're looking at TCJ and you're looking at guilty and fitty, you know, one of what, the most controversial is the, the issue of um, how are states going to treat guilty? And we've kind of been looking at that and analyzing it and reviewing it and discussing it now for the last couple of years. Are they going to provide a deduction? You know, looking at factor relief, are they decoupling? Um, are you a separate return state versus combined? All of these things um, we've been spending a, a lot of time discussing over the last couple of years. Um, and they are maintaining the 20 year carry forward for NOLs. Um, Maryland, oh, that's fine. Again, these are just, these slides are just kind of going over what we are seeing states currently do right now. Um, North Carolina um, adopting the IRC, but, you know, specifically as of 520. Um, so again, fixed date, but they're decoupling from the 163 deduction. Um, 
New Mexico updated the code to conform to TCJA and specifically decoupled from the CARES Act. Now, I don't know, is does Marilyn, do you know, or David, do you know if New Mexico is a rolling or fixed date conformity? Uh, I think they are a fixed state conformity, but I don't know that for a fact. Okay. Um, They're a mess right now too, but I don't know that for that fact. I do. I know. mean, the fact that they actually like decoupled from it would make me, I, I would have to venture to guess that they might be rolling because they would have to take like a proactive um, measure to actually decouple from CARES because if they were fixed, then they could just, uh, just not adopt it in general, but I, I wasn't sure. Um, and then New York City uh, decouples from the CARES Act changes specifically from 163J and 172. The one thing I will add to this, because of the CARES Act, there's going to be the requirement to file amended federal returns, particularly if someone wants to take advantage of the net operating loss provisions of the CARES Act. And those of us on this call all know, or this, this webinar all know that most states would say if you file an amended federal return, you have to file an amended state return. And even though the NOL or why you're amending it could be under 163J too, while you're amending it may have absolutely nothing to do with respect to the state return, you may be required to file an amended federal return. So heads up, this is gonna be another issue I think that's gonna result out of some of this. But just my thoughts, thought, my personal thought on that. And that all, that's all she has to say about that. <laughs> that's that, absolutely. Oh, another time for another polling question. I think we have some people that are having trouble viewing these. And if, if that's the case, um, just email. Um, we'll talk to our IT people and we'll, we'll make sure that you can see them. Um, Someone just asked, Heather Ransom asked for a copy of the slides, and I said, if anyone wants a copy of the slides, you can email in and request them, and we will send them out. Yes. All right, so poll number two, which is in progress. You should see it, uh, except some of you, again, if you're viewing on your phone, it may not generate, and we will get those to you. But the question is, what are the significant state tax issues encountered as a result of TCGA? J, J, J. Sorry, getting my Gs and Js confused. Answers are computation of the business interest expense limitation under section 163J, B, treatment of guilty and taxation of foreign source income, C, depreciation decoupling from the 100% expensing rules, and D, net operating losses. Um, getting close to most of the people voting. Give it a few more seconds. All right, looks like most of the votes are in. Winner is business interest expense limitation under 163J. That does not surprise me. So. Okay. And with that, I believe we're turning it over to Marilyn for this. Oh, kill me. Yay. Still, sorry, didn't mean to cut you off. Nope. No worries. I mean, Marilyn, if you, you want, it's all yours. No, um, <laughs> Thank you. I've got no problem. All right. So, um, guilty. Dun, 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 dun. Um, so one of the primary purposes when you're, we're looking at the TCJ, TCJA, one of the primary policy goals of it was to put an end to what the practice, um, of what the U.S. believe taxpayers were migrating intangible property offshore um, and in an effort to shift significant income derived by this intangible property outside the U.S. Um, and so they came up, you know, we, via the TCGA, we have what I like to refer to as like the carrot and the stick, guilty and fitty. And so um, the TCJ introduced essentially as incentives um, for companies that leave valuable IP in the U.S and sell services and goods outside, hence FIDI, and at the same time penalize taxpayers um, that have migrated IP to say an offshore CFC. Um, and so again, the purpose as the slide says was to, the guilty was to discourage companies from moving business operations to what they call low tax foreign countries. Um, and, you know, prior to the TCJA, the federal uh, corporate income taxes, um, as probably most of us know on this call, um, applied to an entire worldwide income 
of a firm with credits for taxes paid, um, foreign taxes paid. After TCJA, US, the US really um, moved into and now operates mostly kind of under a territorial system. And so the intent of guilty is to tax what has been called the super normal return um, of foreign subs. So when you're looking at that, it is, you know, they have assumed that there's this assumption under the guilty rules that a normal return would yield about uh, anything above like a 10%, um, a 10% of income above 10% of a qualified business asset investment is what they believe would be qualified as super normal. And that super normal portion is they've um, at the federal level, Congress has said is a, a, a good enough proxy, so to speak, for what the intangible income is that is located offshore. Um, it's kind of crazy. Uh, but, but it's this new annual federal calculation that was intended to ensure that a minimum tax is paid on worldwide income. Um, because again, Congress believed that there was being income shifted um, uh, to uh, offshore CFCs. And so primarily guilty is there's three components when you're looking at the federal guilty um, calculation. We have the IRC 951A, which is the guilty provision, which includes global income earned by a taxpayer, um, taxpayers foreign subs, and it makes the assumption on how much is intangible, again, based on the rate of return on tangible assets. And it's that 10% um, 10 of qualified business asset investments, that's also less expenses. But they look at that and say, anything above that they consider super normal and will attribute to the intangible value of this or the value of the intangibles that's offshore. Um, there's the 250 IRC 250 um, that provides for an offsetting deduction to lower the effective tax rate and then foreign tax credits. Um, there's a credit provided for 80% of taxes paid to foreign jurisdictions on the guilty income, um, which in theory was supposed to ensure that only low tax foreign income is being subject to federal taxation. Um, so generally uh, the theory being that a taxpayer is not gonna be subject um, to residual US tax if the average foreign tax rate is above 13 or is at least 13, like 0.1, I think 25%. Um, so taxpayers, again, at the federal level, they're getting this 50% deduction and credits for 80% uh, taxes paid um, to foreign jurisdiction. Um, but unfortunately, at the state level, um, many states conform to the IRC at line 28, which is before credits and deductions. So it brings it, the issue that we immediately saw is that at the state level, you're bringing in this guilty under 951A, but without the 50% deduction or credits paid for foreign taxes. And this, the result being is that it results in state taxation of this guilty income, which is be, ultimately results in a very aggressive being very aggressive and really lacking any pretense of only applying to low taxed foreign income. And um, David, I think we can go to the next, the next slide. Um, and so the impact, so the global, like looking at the rationale for this and for guilty and for state taxation, again, global, um, Yes, it includes all global income earned by the taxpayers' foreign subsidies um, con conducting an active trader business. Um, and that is what the, the starting point is supposed to be. Um, the rationale limited to intangibles. However, it includes a significant income from services, digital products, financial services, a sizable portion of tangible personal property sales and intangibles. So for instance, if you're looking at a company um, like let's use a telecom company for instance that has um property that they could depreciate that has highly depreciable property that is depreciated very low and they're operating in a foreign country this property is located off um, overseas if you have property that is operating in a business that's been depreciated um, there is this automatic assumption that um, income derived from that could be attributed to actual intent that that's actually intangible uh, it, related to the sale of intangibles in some way when really that is actually 
um, directly connected to real property or tangible property. Um, but again, that's one of the pitfalls that we're looking at. And that is a common industry, you know, so that's an industries that utilize highly depreciable property face that um, issue when looking when when dealing with guilty. So um, the whole idea that it's limited to intangible income is a fallacy. Uh, low taxed, the states, as I said, do not, um, states don't conform to the 80% foreign tax credit. Most, a lot of states don't um, allow for federal tax purposes to offset the guilty. In addition, many of the states, again, like I said, don't conform to 250, um, section 250, you know, if you're a state that starts with um, line 28. Um, and then offset by corporate tax cuts. Um, at the federal level, this issue was uh, considered a base broadener because of the lowered rate. However, the issue we were looking at the state level is that states haven't lowered the rate so that there was no, you know, that didn't have the same effect at the state level as we saw at the federal level. Marilyn, anything to add? Nope. 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 All right. State conformity issues. Um, the inclusion, again, what I talked about of the 250 deduction, you're, you have to look at whether states are, you know, adopt, starting with line 28 versus line 30. Some states, um, some states have responded by also exploring factor relief, but um, to reduce the cost. But we have to look at like what factor relief would really um, would would really encompass. Um, do you have to? Um, do they? Is it limited to? Uh, is it limited to the, um, do they have to take into consideration the deductions if you're looking at factor relief or do they, do they not? I think now the state I was trying to remember the example of, it was Iowa. Um, so Iowa, the recent um, adoption just happened on July 20th um, and they have the retroactive to January 1st of 2019. So again, um, they decoupled from guilty and they but they said taxpayers who included it in their 2019 filing will need to file an amended return. And again, also keep in mind another interesting issue that happens with you know state conformity issues is that you know this means that guilty is excluded. What happened? This also means then taxpayers can't take the corresponding um, IRC 250 deductions as well. Um, and so that could have huge ramifications when you're looking at the amended return um, or looking to file amended return. Also, the interplay with now, if you're in a state that has adopted CARES and you have the ability to carry back NOLs, how is that, you know, this could get quite dicey at the state level. Um, and then one of the main issues that has been looked at, particularly on our side, um, is the constitutionality of guilty. Um, because of the, the craft precedent. So um, there's a separate reporting states seeking to tax guilty face definite constitutional issues um, as the constitution forbids obvious discrimination, um, discriminatory tax of foreign economic activity. So if a state does not include US-based subs in a consolidated group for taxation, it cannot include international subs CFCs within the filing group because it would violate the foreign commerce clause. Um, and in Kraft, we saw the Supreme Court say or strike down a business tax, Iowa's business tax that allowed for a dividends received deduction for domestic um, entities, but not foreign subs. And so there's this issue of whether or not, you know, if you're a separate reporting state, um, it's important whether or not they would even be allowed to include guilty, um, adopt guilty, or, you know, I, there's a, school of thought or main school of thought that um, if for a separate reporting states, it's just not constitutional for them to, to uh, include guilty. Next slide, David. Or if you have anything to add, guys, for, feel free to jump in. Um, so the right now- I say about decoupling, there's a number of states who obviously have decoupled, but they decoupled prior to COVID-19 and prior to the um, need for revenue. And so there's a question in the back of my mind as to whether or not this list may change as we go forward, because certainly there is a school of thought by a number of academics and one general counsel of the Massachusetts Department of Revenue who believe that guilty should be taxed. And if there's a need for revenue, this seems to be one of the locations that the states could go to and 
while they may have decoupled or did not adopt it because of static conformity, they may, very well may change their minds about how they handle it. Yeah, but what's, you know, to that point, you know, if looking at like taking the separate reporting is separate state issue and looking at the combined reporting state issue and you're if they choose to tax it. Um, what one of the main what one of the main issues that presents itself then is factor representation and what does that look like I mean Marilyn from your opinion, what would factor representation look like because there's, a, you know, basic principles to follow and there's definitely different opinions on what factor representation should look like um, and do you know, do you think that factor representation is enough of a fix for states that include guilty? Well, certainly there was a factor representation issue that was litigated in the 90s with respect to the taxation of foreign source income. NCR litigated it, didn't win it, litigated it in probably a half a dozen states. You would think that you would either have to use the property and payroll, which is not a real factor any longer of the foreign entity. Factor representation, in theory, I think may solve it. I think in practice, Determining what it's going to be when you have most states that are single sales factor states, I think is really tough. Yeah. And NCR certainly wasn't very successful in the 90s when it was a three factor formula. So um, I think you're going to have to rely more on the fact that you're taxing foreign source income and the states are, despite what Michael Fatale's 35 page paper says, um, that the states are, um, are, are prohibited from it because of the foreign commerce clause. I, and I, I know, and I know an issue that I've what that we have seen is that this disconnect between states and at the federal level of whether or not there you have to reduce foreign gross sales um, to account for the two, section 250 deduction because at the federal level the original intent of 250 um, was a rate deduction and not meant to um, adjust the tax base um, but at the at the state level, you've seen states take the position that if you're going to get factor rep, you have to reduce um, foreign gross sales according to the deduction that you took at the federal, the 250 deduction. And so um, I think that's also another interesting, another interesting point that, or kind of another interesting, uh, some of the interesting weeds you can get in on when you start looking at factor representation specifically. I think the next slide we are going to go into FIDI. So foreign derived intangible income, also section, a subsect, different subsection of IRC 250. Um, FIDI is the income of US corporations that is attributable to um, property sold or licensed to a foreign person for foreign use and services provided outside the United States. Um, it provides a 37.5% deduction um, and that is decreased, you know, in the first year, and that is decreased. Uh, that is decreased after I think in 2025. Um, results in a federal uh, effective tax rate on covered income of 13.125, like I mentioned earlier, and it's calculated in a similar manner to guilty. Again, remember looking like looking at the concept of like a normal, a super normal return with that 10% um, of fix anything in in excess of the 10% of fixed assets, it's can, um, considered a reasonable proxy for um, what income that you can attribute to the uh, to IP. Um, oh yeah, it's decreased to 21.875 after 2025. I can't tell if it says that on our slide actually, because we're, our heads are covering that, but I have it in my notes. Um, and FIDI is intended to approximate income from the sale, again, of goods and services abroad um, to U.S. Uh, held intangibles. And um, the share of the excess income is allocated to the sale of goods and services. So like a really, a very easy elementary example would be if you have a U.S. corporation, um, and again, again, this applies to domestic C-Corps. If you have a U.S. corporation that earned $100 million, um, with tangible assets of uh, 200 million, the corporation would allocate um, the 80 million, the deemed income, intangible income between the sales of goods and services, and the U.S. would tax the share of the 80 million allocated to the foreign sales at that 13.125 percent, opposed to the number normal 21 percent. And um, they include FIDI in U.S. corporations include FIDI in. Uh, uh -huh, include FIDI in gross income, but allowed a deduction under um, 250 of the 
Section 250 of the 37.5%. Okay, David, you can go into the next slide. Um, some considerations to think about when we're looking at FIDI for the state impact is our, again, looking at, um, looking at factor relief and look thinking of different opportunities that 50 might provide is that you know our sales related to um, 50 excluded from the sales factor to, again to the extent of the deduction and it also might provide for interesting um, state posi sourcing positions so again if you are um, market source services to foreign customers that could affect your factor or source sales of TPP offshore. There are a lot of different planning opportunities when you're looking at FIVD and also um, when you're dealing with CFCs and the ability to potentially, um, if you had been dealing with like a disregarded entity, um, changing that to potentially a flow through could also prevent, could provide um, additional FIVD, um relief that you may not have had prior, prior to that. So we should, so we are now on what, in my opinion, should give everybody on this webinar heartburn, because to me, this is the TCJA provision that created currently, from what I'm hearing, a significant amount of issues and administrative headaches at the, at the state level. And clearly what it is, it's a, it, the government, it, the feds at the federal level, it, the purpose was to limit business interest expense. And the reason for that was there was a lot of tax cuts and there had to be a makeup somewhere along the line of the revenue that was going to be lost at the federal level. And this was one of the ways to make it up. So basically it limits your deduction for business interest expense. And originally it limited it basically to 30% of your ATI. And we'll talk a little bit about how ATI is, is computed, not in any great depth because the way it's computed at the federal level is what part, gives you part heartburn at the state level. Um, but the one thing that's important about this is there's really no distinction between investment interest expense and what would be ordinary business interest expense. And at the state level, we know that that's, that's an important distinction. So it was 30% prior to the CARES Act. The CARES Act then upped the limit to 50%, as, as Brian and David said earlier, and also allowed you to, in computing your 2020, the return that is not going to be filed for another year and a half, 2020 uh, interest disallowance, upped it to, to allow you to use your 2019 um, ATI. So let's look a little bit at ATI, which is on the next slide, David. Um, it, it's in, you, basically, you have to look at how this is computed compared to um, how it would be computed, how you would compute taxable income at the state level. So if, if you look at it in the context of calculating taxable income for state tax purposes, some of the items that are on this list would definitely have different characterizations. And the one that pops out is um, maybe business interest or business interest income may not be business income at a state level. So some of these items, because they have different characterizations at the state level, give you some interesting results, maybe some possibilities for planning but more likely, I think more of a possibility to end up being doubled up with um, an expense deduction that you're not gonna be allowed to use. So let's talk about the overview on, on the next slide, David. Let's talk about the overview of what it is. If in fact you have exceeded your 30% or 50% limit, um, you have an indefinite carryover at the federal level and you also provides for certain limitations, but, but with respect to that carryover, your 30% or 50% limitation applies in the carryover year. But the limitation at the federal level applies to both related party and unrelated party debt. So keep that thought in mind for the state side of it, because at the state side, when we start talking about add back statutes, you generally are not required, or basically you're never required to add back interest expense that is paid to an unrelated third party. There's also some pass-through entity issues with respect to 163J, and I think the feds yesterday just issued some more guidance on this that we are not going to get into today. There's also, and it also thing what we're not going to get into today, under section 163J, there are some exemptions for regulated utilities 
um, that, which makes it really complicated if you have a regulated utility in your federal consolidated um, return group as to how you allocate the interest expense. So let's talk a little bit about what happens at the federal level. Um, it applies to a consolidated groups at the filing. Basically, the 163J limitation is applied to a taxpayer. But at the, if you file a consolidated federal return, that return group is considered a taxpayer. So you begin with consolidated taxable income and without regard to any intercompany transactions or obligations. So that's how it's computed. But if you look at it from a state filing perspective, the, first of all, your consolidated group and your state group are not likely to be the same. So that then requires you to what? Split the interest expense out between the various members of the consolidated group that are then applied, that then become part of whatever filing group you have at the state, be it a separate return, a combined return, or a consolidated return. So you have to allocate it out. At the federal level, it is allocated out, but it's allocated out on a different a different method, I think, than what you would use at the state level. So let's go back to state conformity, which is, which is on the next slide. So this is key. Does the state adopt this new section 163J? Did it adopt it under TCJA? Um, or now does it adopt it automatically, does the 50% automatically kick in because of the CARES Act? If in fact the state has not adopted 163J, why? And the question is, if in fact it was because they decoupled, um, they had rolling conformity, they decoupled, then there's a real question as to whether or not you have any interest limitation at all uh, at the state level. And what do you do with the federal interest limitation that was there? Do, do you take full deduction for it? That issue is out there. If in fact they had static conformity, then, and it was prior to the adoption of TCJA in, in 18, then the question becomes, are you under the old section 163J, which had to do with the ratio of assets and capital and, and things like that. So two things to take into consideration when you look at what you're dealing with at the state level, if they've decoupled, there may be no limitation at all, and you may get to add back or take, or take the interest expense deduction that was not allowed on the federal return. Um, second question you have to ask yourself is, are we dealing really, really with a 30% or 50% haircut on the expense when you look at it at the state level? Because if you, the way adjusted taxable income is computed at the federal level certainly doesn't take into consideration adjustments that are made at the state level to, to federal taxable income. Everyone knows that there's additions, modifications, and subtraction modifications that exist that do not exist at the federal level. So when you look at the 30% or the 50% now after CARES, is that really what the haircut is at the state level? It's likely to be more than that. Mm -hmm. um, in general, you gotta look at, we talked a little bit earlier about how this limitation is, is, is computed. So basically, what kind of filing method are you, are you utilizing in any specific state? If in fact you're on a separate return basis and there's still states down in the Southeast that are separate returns, um, what do you do with the expense limitation? Do you prorate it? Um, do you compute a pro forma? That'll give everyone heartburn because that's just one more step in the compliance function that you probably don't have time for. Um, and what about the carry forward? Has the state adopted a carry forward? Will they allow the carry forward? Um, if you're talking about a consolidated return situation, um, you have to look and see whether or not the group is the same as the group you had at the federal level. Um, if you have a nexus consolidation, Virginia allows nexus consolidations, other states allow nexus consolidations, Kansas, is that your same group that was the group at the, at the federal level? The answer may be no, and now we're back to, do we prorate the 163J limitation and how do we handle that? Um, also, you have to ask yourself at the if filing a state consolidated return is have they adopted the federal consolidated return regs or variations of them. On a combined return, same questions again. Are you dealing with the same members of the group? And have, do they adopt on the combined side the uh, consolidated return regulations? 
Other issues with respect to state conformity um, come into play with respect to, um, next slide, I think, David, uh, come into play with uh, respect to ordering. There are a number of states that have add back provisions, and we need to talk about those a little bit, but have add back provisions. So what comes first? Does the, does the federal business in interest uh, limitation kick in first, and then you apply the add back rules? Um, and generally, I think the answer to that is yes, because most states start with either line 28 or line 30. So the federal, uh, the federal deduction haircut would already be reflected in that. So and, on, and then if you layer on top of that, the uh, add back provisions, there is a potential of doubling up because there's definitely an interplay between the add back provisions and the federal 163J limitation, which takes into consideration both third party interest and intercompany interest. Most of the add back statutes um, require you, unless you meet one of the safe harbors, require you to add back interest paid to a related party. Well, if that's already been added back and taken into consideration in the 163J computation, the question is, have you not doubled up? And I have not seen anyone, I think, not that I've done a totally extensive study of every state. I don't think I've seen any state put out any guidance on how to make an adjustment to the fact that you could end up with a doubling up of intercompany or intergroup interest. Um, also, so you maybe end up tracking separately at a state level your 163J uh, deductions. The question is, how do you apply safe harbors? Uh, do the safe harbors apply to the federal portion of the expense elimination? Maybe. Um, that's not the way the statutes are written, but it may be something you want to raise. Um, the other most states should allow the carry forward if they adopt the Internal Revenue Code and they, they've already adopted 163J. But the question of the carry forward then becomes an issue of how, what your apportionment is. And there is a distinct possibility that you could lose part of the carry forward because of a change in your apportionment. Your apportionment percentage could go down and you wouldn't get the full benefit of carry forward. That is not an issue at the, at the federal level. And that wasn't anything that I think that was probably taken into consideration. Certainly the feds were not taking state taxes into consideration when they were looking to fill a revenue need by, by cutting back on the uh, deductions. The, the change from anybody who has rolling conformity now and has it decoupled from 163J is going to have an issue with the utilization of the 2019 ATI to, to apply to your 2020 business interest expense limitation because you're utilizing that at the federal level, but at the state level on the add back side, you're not gonna have, the states are not gonna say, well, you look at your 2019, they're gonna say you're gonna add back the interest from 2020. So you have, a, in my opinion, you have a mismatch. I'm not exactly sure what you can do about it. And I haven't seen any guidance put out about it. The fact of the matter is there's been very little guidance that has been put out on, um, on 163J. New Jersey issued a bulletin a, a little over a year ago, which, and then they had to issue a bulletin to explain the bulletin that they issued. It is the most complicated, convoluted explanation I think I've ever read in my, in my career. Um, so I, if New Jersey's an issue, I would suggest you have a beer before you read it. Uh, the Pennsylvania Department of Revenue also about the same time last April issued a bulletin uh, with respect to how they were gonna treat it. Virginia put a commission together to study it and I thought they were supposed to issue their, their determination by the end of December. I don't know whether or not they have done that, but I think you're gonna need more guidance out there on all of this. These are the states right now, um, hopefully, this is inclusive as to about a week or so ago, that have either explicitly decoupled from 163J. Um, but I then, same statement I made with respect to guilty, there's a question in my mind because of the revenue needs of the state as to when the, any of this is going to be reevaluated and, and, um, and thought, we thought through because it, once again, it would definitely raise some revenues with respect to, and which the states desperately need right now. 
Reen, David, thoughts on any of this? Um, no. Nope. Moving on then. It's up earlier, so. All right, net operating losses, which I think we've, uh, Breen touched on in her, in her deck as well. And we have one more polling question, but it appears that might be coming after the fact. But uh, what we already, uh, I think this was already brought up, but let's just touch on it real quickly. So the TCJA imposed the 80% uh, taxable income limitation net carry back loss, but only did so for uh, the 2000, for tax years ended 2017. So what did CARES Act do? CARES expanded that, and not only did they lift the 80% limitation and make it 100%, but they instituted a five-year NOL carryback for the tax years 2018 through 2020. Uh, what does this mean from a state tax perspective? This was also mentioned already. Uh, not as much because um, uh, the, the states are going to decouple from this provision, but what is going to be likely required uh, due to the amending of a federal return is the amending of, of a state return as well. So um, not a lot of impact uh, with this from a state perspective, but just be uh, mindful of the uh, uh, um, amending your state tax returns. Uh, four, I do have four states do currently uh, follow the elimination of the 80% and, and provide for an eight, five year carry back. And those four states are Alaska, Delaware, Maryland, and Oklahoma, with the exception of now Maryland, because we talked about the opinion that the comptroller uh, put out decoupled from the NOL provision. Here is our third polling question. Oh, this is a good one. <laughs> Well, for any baseball fans, it does say baseball's back. Uh, questionable whether baseball will be back for the remainder of the year due to anyone watching this has seen what's happened with the Miami Marlins. Now 17 individuals from that team have tested positive, but MLB did put out a statement that said that so far has been limited to that team. But the question is, who will win the World Series? And Marilyn and I definitely know the answer to this question. I drafted the question, so... You didn't even put any alternatives. No, there is no alternative. All right. So looks like it's the Cubs for that one. Um, does that wrap this one up, or is there more on? That wraps this one up. If anybody has any questions, we'd be happy to take them while David is putting up the next deck. Marilyn, you have some comments that Julie says, go Cubs, go. Perfect. If my phone went off during then the course of this. All, oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Stephanie. All right, let's see if we can bear with me a minute. Might have to disconnect and connect again like I did. David's having some technical difficulties on his end with the two screens. Yeah, th those of us who aren't, they don't have the luxury of two screens at home don't have the issue. All right, I'm gonna. Can you guys see that? Yep. There you go. All right, so we're going to shift our focus a little bit now and talk more on the indirect side. And so um, the, the purpose of this is uh, potentially with the economy and fluctuating and, and as volatile as it is, we might see, um, we just went through a recent activity where there was a lot of M&A activity. Um, and while uncertain times may stop some of that M&A activity, uh, we also might see some um, consolidation and, and just some and continued uh, mergers and acquisitions. So 
what we want to do is talk about some of the basic concepts to be aware of if you are either acquiring another company or being acquired by someone. And this again is going to focus on the indirect side. And um, just a little bit about this. So uh, in, in a former life, I was uh, an employee of GE Capital. And so um, about four years ago, four or five years ago, I remember the day we were sitting there and we got an announcement that GE Capital was going to divest its entire portfolio or at least a large part of it. So to put it in perspective of what we were dealing with, uh, many of us might have saw the $750 million deal that was uh, uh, provided to, to Kodak yesterday. And I looked at that number and thought, wow, that's, that's pretty big. Um, but to give you an idea of the GE divestiture, there it was a two billion dollar. Uh, there was two billion worth of assets that had to be uh, sold off, and and what happened was there was a lot of divisions at GE Capital. Some of those were executed in the form of a stock sale; others were in an asset sale. So, one of the purposes of this presentation is not just uh, the ramifications of M and A and indirect tax but also how you plan and prepare and kind of walking you through the steps if in fact you are going to acquire or, or be acquired. So um, we are gonna talk about the overview, just mergers and acquisition and the sales tax impact. We'll talk about stock sales structuring, asset sales structuring, how do you prepare for that? And then also what are some of the post-closing steps that, that you need to be aware of? Um, I think there's a polling question to get us started, maybe not. Uh, Breen, you want to start? Sure. Um, well, to begin, before I go over the four key questions for M&A, I, I would actually say, um, yeah, uh, so the ones we have on the slide, is there a sale or other transfer? Obviously very key because when you're looking at, particularly when you're looking at like different uh, internal restructuring or internal reorgs, depending on how those are actually structured, you could avoid sometimes having the sale that is there. Um, if you, you know, for instance, if you're looking at like a parent um, company that absorbs a sub or if you have two subs that are uh, absorbed into each other, um, I, is there consideration, again, these, this is like going back to your basics, right? Is there consideration for the sale or the transfer? Um, is their property the type that is actually subject to tax? So tangible personal property of, uh, opposed to um, a sale of an intangible. And then are there any exemptions that apply? I would also actually um put another one on there um that i i don't know if we touch on or not um i can't remember but you know is the acquirer potentially liable you know for any sales tax or anything due um that might be owed by the transfer um i would add that on because i know a lot of times especially when you're looking at when you're looking at um, multi-layer deals and you're ha and you're involving one uh if you have a deal that involves a lot of assets um that potentially could come into play. And that is a large part of what the due diligence will be on um, the buyer side. Um, and so, and also sometimes when you're dealing on the seller side, if anyone's ever been involved on the seller side, sometimes you have a lot of uh, cleanup that you have to do in order, in order to get the, the sale, the sale um, ready to go. David, if you want to go. Um, Again, is it looking at the first the first prong? Is there a sale or other transfer? So don't assume that because the transfer happens between two affiliated entities, um, or that because it's an intercorporate transfer that there won't be tax due. Um, that is not the case. Um, you know, in the example we use here, the drop down of assets from a parent to a wholly owned sub. So in this case they the parent created a new sub specifically to drop down assets and the assets in that case were actually cars um they were so it was a transfer of vehicles in exchange for stock and securities and the court ended up the tennessee court ended up holding that that was a taxable sale because it was between two separate entities and in the decision the court actually went into the analysis of the difference between having a um a situation where the parent, again, what I just mentioned a minute ago, where the parent might absorb the sub and there's actually no transfer um, of the property to this situation where they created the new sub purposefully for the specific reason of dropping down these assets and then they received consideration in exchange for those assets um, in the form of stock and securities. And 
because of that, because it was, there was a, there was in existence, a separate sub actually that what that was there to take the assets. Um, the court found that, you know, it is much different than having a situation where the parent might have just absorbed the sub and acquired the assets in that fashion. So again, even when you're looking at a transfer affiliated entities, that still can be a taxable sale. Well, what, the one thing I would say, having spent some time in my prior life in a corporation, is that a lot of this starts with your federal, not to diss anybody on this call, on this webinar who's federal tax person starts with your federal tax people and sometimes they forget they may talk to the income tax side of the state department state tax department sometimes they forget the other side of, of, of the transaction tax side because well, this may have been a tax-free no yeah in maryland that you reminded me that brings up a great point because there is the federal guys yeah well not just the federal guys but that there is that that brings up, brings up a great point so Having done M&A, having having done M&A presentations before and, and covering both the income tax and the the indirect side of it, you have a disconnect between the direct and the indirect side. And this was I forgot to mention this, and Marilyn reminded me this was for federal income tax purposes a non-taxable incorporation under 351. And so there was this assumption that it would not be a taxable sale um, on the on obviously the sales tax side because it was non-taxable on the income, the federal income tax side. And that is not correct. So that is that is a great point and, it, and a very important reminder that you have to, you can't assume that because on the income tax side, it might be considered a non-taxable reorg that the same rule is gonna apply um, on the indirect side. So thank you, Marilyn, for reminding me. So yeah, that's a great point. Dealing with it. And, and it's a great point that uh, I was going to address a little bit later, but the timings right now is it's not just collaboration amongst the sales and the income tax folks. It's it's bringing in everyone in this kind of deal, uh, especially depending on the size of it, whether that's the legal team, the operations, compliance, everyone, there needs to be stakeholders at the table when you're doing these types of deals because uh, we know in our world, the state tax world, everyone forgets about us and they come to us at the last minute, especially on the on the uh, indirect side is they, they have this deal effectuated. They're going to structure it as an asset sale and they don't think that there might be some sales tax on the asset sale. So good point. Bring everyone together. Collaboration works. All right. I think we kind of talked about this a little. So inter, again, intercorporate transfer sales and use um, taxes might be important depending on how the transaction is structured. And um, some, some state laws actually do provide exemptions, and I think I may be skipping ahead a little. I can't remember if exemptions is actually one of the slides, but some states actually do provide exemptions um, that need to be analyzed, you know, based on what kind of reorganization it is. And again, not every state is consistent in those exemptions, so you have to be very careful about where, you know, what state law is controlling. But, you know, for instance, with um, A reorgs, um, Many states provide specific exemptions for trans, uh, transfers pursuant to a statutory merger or consolidation. Um, when you're looking at an F reorg, that's considered um, that's a mere change in identity and form or place of organization, and not not necessarily or not generally the subject of state specific exemption. So again, like you have to be very careful in what form the um, the reorg is taking and whether or not there's exemption specific at the state level. Um, are these intercorporate transactions anticipated if they're going to be taxable? Um, and again, a lot of this comes into the pre-planning because, you know, um, looking at what is actually be tran being transferred and whether it is taxable or not. So um, many times when you're dealing in these transactions, there is a tangible asset that could be attached or would be attached to the intangible the sale of intangible, of an intangible. And if so, with the tangible asset, sales tax would be due. But when you're doing a major sale like this, if you're doing, an, if you're involved in the acquisition, you know, when you're dealing in a transaction of a certain, uh, of any nature, really, it's important to make sure you bifurcate those out and allocate the purchase price amongst both the tangible and intangible assets. Because again, sales tax is going to attach to the transfer generally of the tangible assets, unless the state you're dealing in provides for a specific exemption. Yep. And I just dawned on me, 
there may not be a placeholder for the poll questions in this, so we are going to run our first poll question. Okay. All right, so first question is, have you ever worked on a transaction where your company uh, acquired another or your company was being acquired by someone else? All right, getting close with the results. Give it a few more seconds, all right. Uh, so we have almost a unanimous yes. So we have some people on the call or on the webinar with some M&A experience. And I'm sure that everyone on the call can probably share some good experiences and some not so good experiences. At least we didn't have anyone say they were only here for CLE. Yeah. So. <laughs> Thanks for your honesty, it's appreciated. Yes, I, that, thank you. Again, I did just touch on this when, um, is there, is there, you know, under the consideration prong, an F reorg is generally considered a non-event for sales tax purpose because it's a change in identity or form and not necessarily an actual transfer of assets or um, uh, an, an actual sale occurring. Cardinal rules. Um, Again, think I already went over this substantively in the prior slides. Do, do not assume that the transaction is tax-free because it might be, again, a, for instance, in the case like a 351, uh, a non-taxable uh, incorporation under 351, or if it's a non-taxable event on the income tax side or at the federal level, you should not assume that the same is gonna be said for the state level or for lo or local tax purposes. Um, and again, do not assume that because the transaction is exempt in one state, it's going to be exempt in the other, in another. Um, definitely, I mean, old school, like basic, make sure you consult your specific state statutes to know what rules you're playing with. Um, because as we all know, and it, and it gives us for those of, it keeps us all employed, um, that the states are not uniform and not consistent. So the rules can and will vary from state to state. You know, one state without getting into nuances, one state that jumps out at me that has very specific and new, uh, aggressive rules when it comes to um, mergers and acquisitions and, and, and different reorgs is New York. They have a lot of case law on it as well. Yeah, and even within a state, home rule authorities. Uh, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about Colorado as an example, but that, that's one where the state level exemptions may not be applicable with the particular home rules, city and county of Denver, Aurora, or whatever. Home yeah, rules. yeah, and when you're even looking at the exemption rules too, getting more granular you know, than that, when you're thinking also, um, when you're dealing in a sale and on the sales tax side, and you're having to do bulk sale, bulk sale notices, if you're dealing in a home rule, they're gonna have their own requirements, they're gonna have their own filing um, that you have to do, they're gonna have their, you're gonna have to give notice at the local level too. So in our home, our home jurisdiction of Chicago, you're gonna have a bulk sale um, uh, requirement and obligation in the city of Chicago as well as the state of Illinois. And a lot of times the city of Chicago is overlooked. And Cook County. And Cook, and Cook, and Cook County. County which... And Cook County. See, I did it myself. <laughs> I have some examples with Cook County bulk sale coming up too. Well, yeah, and that's primarily too because Cook County doesn't make it exactly easy to know. Um, so what the property that's being sold, is it subject to sales tax? Again, you know, professional services excluded, intangible property, um, gener you know, generally not subject to tax. And again, what are you selling? So it, there's a difference between selling the underlying tangible personal property versus an interest in the, the lease payment or the stream of payment coming in on that tangible personal property. One is an intangible right to that payment. The other is the actual underlying asset. Um, business entity interest, um, again, intangibles and then real property. Like you have to make sure, confirm that what you're selling in the state is, is subject to sales tax. If there, or in, and if it is subject to sales tax, is, is there some exemption that the state might apply? 
inventory, <laughs> um, then what what is what is exempt from sales tax? What is subject to tax? Inventory um, subject to tax, but don't forget your resale certificates. Um, and then a lot of times there's the public policy exemptions, right? That at the state level that just make for good public policy to have exempt. Um, a lot of states exempt the sale of grocery foods, drugs, um, machinery and equipment, but that is almost becoming the exception to the rule more than the rule these days when you're looking at the state level as to what is exempt, uh, you know, machinery exemptions. And then transactional exemptions, generally you're looking at like the actual entity being subject to tax. And again, getting in the nuances, the nuances of this, it's like, was that purchase by the actual US government and not somebody on behalf of the US government? States have very weird rules when it comes to that, that it has to be purchased by the actual exempt entity and not an employee of the entity, something to you know make sure you're looking at. Casual and isolated sales. A lot of states have casual sale rules or casual sale exemptions. Um, that you have to look at or temporary storage exemptions, things of that nature. And again, the temporary storage can come into play depending on how the transaction is structured. If you have to, you know, we've had issues with clients where they've had to house actual inventory or some of their assets in a state, in a state for a short period of time until the sale actually um, effectuates. There was a deal that I helped on um, a few years back where the client transfer transferred the hard assets to the state of the buyer prior to the sale actually going through and the sale that this that state did not have a temporary storage exemption um, and it just became a huge mess so um again just little things to think about that sometimes get lost um, when you're dealing particularly with large um large material um m a transactions the, the one thing i will say on the occasional sales or the isolated sales be careful in a number of states as to how many you've made that year. California is, the tra is a trap. And also be careful if you're holding a retail license because you may not be able to take advantage of an isolated sales exemption. Wisconsin, you have to surrender your license before you can take the exemption. Yeah, we've actually, Marilyn and I actually had, um, and I mean, we, we've had states actually go back like 20 years and look at how many different um, divestures like we that our client had done to prove that like that they were actually in the business of buying and selling assets. So um, that is something that happens, particularly again if you're dealing with uh, if you're dealing with a, a transaction that is high dollars, you're going to have a lot more scrutiny on that, um, especially if it does potentially fall into uh, state exemption. States are going to be the departments are going to be looking that at that a lot closer um, than you might anticipate. Another thing I want to mention before I pass it off to David is I think a lot of these rules, remember a lot of this, all, it, it's equally applicable to when you're doing re, internal reorgs. Again, you get into, a, a, you potentially could face um, or be the, have the benefit of, um, you know, if it's a, if, if it's a considered um, an F reorg or, you know, uh, an exempt, a reorganization that's of the exempt nature. But I think a lot of times, um, these these rules particularly are overlooked when you're de dealing with internal restructuring. And I think it's, I always want to take a minute to say that is just as important to consider these things for internal reorg purposes. Um, and also there's a lot of planning that you can do when you're dealing with internal reorg opposed to um, a basic M&A, so. Yeah, I think on this point, uh, in my experience in-house and then also advising clients now, anytime an indirect audit comes up, it seems as though the very first request that that an auditor is going to ask for when there are exempt sales is give me all your exemption certificates. So when we look at the inventory exemption with resale certificates, or if a company is claiming any exemptions for manufacturing drugs or whatever the case may be, um, and, and we're going to get into this, but from a diligence perspective, ensuring that the exemption forms are on file if you're a seller or if you are, you know, if they've purchased goods and claimed exemptions in the past, that they have a copy of the exemption certificate that they've uh, provided to the seller and that they're using the property for an exempt purpose because that's that's low-hanging fruit for auditors they're going to come in right away and that's going to be the first thing at least in my experience what they ask for and also make sure it's current um, a mm -hmm. lot of people think that goes without being said uh, but again a lot of these exemption certificates have a shelf life um, and it might be a company it might be you know th this might be something that you've been you know, it, it might be 20 years old and it actually expired 10 years ago. So it's something to make sure 
um, that you know not only are is everything documented accordingly, but also that it's all current and up to date. Yeah, good point on that too. Something that just came to me. It's not just exemption certificates that you have filled out and provided to the seller, but what if it's a state issued exemption certificate, such as I know Illinois provides those uh, authorizations to 501c3s uh, and Florida is another state that issues annually uh, exemption certificates for certain entities. So it's not as much as just making sure that, that the business has filled it out, that you at the tax department have filled it out and provided to the seller, but have you applied to those jurisdictions and obtain the the, uh, the the exemption certificates from those states that actually issue them. Is this your last one, Bree? Um, yeah, but I think we you can just take it over. I think we kind of covered all this already. So okay, just being aware of what is and is not subject to sales tax. Okay, so with that, let's. Um, go to our second polling question. Oh, this is a fun one. We're going to test your Chicago knowledge with this. Ooh. And which of the following is not an ingredient on a Chicago dog? Oh, I'm cringing at some of the answers. Oh, it's everyone's gonna go. Oh, I know which one you're cringing at. It's the obvious thing, or maybe I guess it's not that obvious for people not from here. Yeah, by and large, we're getting the right answer, but uh, it's gonna be a good learning opportunity. Give it a few more seconds, folks still coming in. <laughs> All right, so and the answer is uh, sport pepper, poppy seed, ketchup, celery salt. And the correct answer uh, is ketchup. So uh, kudos to 57% of you. Uh, that is, I think, one thing you never put on your hot dog well in Chicago if you're around a true Chicago. And you will get criticized and just kind of get, you, you, you'll you probably get a dirty look from the person that you're ordering. Stephanie said, I have to share this because this is funny. Stephanie said, the hot dog. <laughs> <laughs> and no Backstrom, we do not put Louisiana hot sauce on it. Sorry. All right. So stock sale. So green walked us through kind of the basics of what's going on with sales tax. So as a general rule, we know that sales tax is imposed on the sale, transfer, uh, possession of tangible personal property. So when we're talking about stock sales and actually the transfer of an intangible interest, uh, generally the rule is no sales tax, right? And, and that is correct, but just want to be careful. Um, Breen, one or uh, Breen's earlier slides identified a handful of states that do have a quirky results, uh, particularly with disregarded entities. Um, those five states, Alabama, Missouri, South Carolina, Tennessee, Wisconsin, uh, where the, the courts or the statutory language looks through that transaction and says, nope, we're not going to treat this as a sale of an intangible and said this is going to be a sale of assets, thereby triggering sales tax on this transfer. Um, also, uh, controlling interest taxes with real estate. Um, not sure how many of us deal with real estate, but just something else to be aware of. If your tax department is going through this M&A and you have a real property division, make sure you're in touch with them. Some st states have quirky rules and they don't look at necessarily the, the transfer of ownership on the title, which would be staying the same with a uh, stock sale, but necessarily the controlling interest. And they're, they, they would view that as a, a different party is coming into controlling interest of that real estate, thereby triggering a, a transfer tax on, on real estate. So it's not as though if it is in fact a stock sale that, it, and you know there is gonna be some M&A activity that you can tune out from a sales and use tax perspective. Uh, there is still going to be some diligence uh, associated with, uh, if you're acquiring a company, it's gonna be a stock sale. Uh, if they are in the business of selling any uh, tangible personal property, or incurring any sales tax liability, there is still gonna be some due diligence in looking at prior audit activity of that company, um, filing positions, where are they located 
Uh, is there going to be, um, if you're a smaller company, uh, maybe acquiring a company in a presence that you otherwise were not located, are you going to have new filing obligations? So I do want to caution everyone that, okay, you're at a company, you hear that you're going to acquire someone else, it's going to be a stock sale, you're on the indirect team, you can just phase everything out and not have to worry about it. There are going to be steps uh, that ultimately you are going to have to undertake in a resulting acquisition of another entity. So what are the pros? Well, from a buyer and a seller, um, you, you, this may not be applicable to everyone, but anytime there's motor vehicles involved, there's about 20 to 25 states um, that, that really ding people on asset sales with motor vehicles. But on a stock sale, you're going to avoid little things, little operational tasks that maybe don't cost money necessarily, but they're just a pain. Um, odometer readings, replatings, and the sales tax associated with the changing of title on any title property, whether that's aircraft, helicopter, um, any kind of drilling equipment for oil companies, anything that requires a titling. Uh, also, there's just hidden costs with that. If, you, if, if you're executing an uh, asset sale and you have to re-register all the vehicles, all the DMV, and I, I mean, I don't know if there's anyone probably listening that likes to visit a DMV. I know I don't, but that's maybe one of the worst places on earth. So the fact that you can avoid it with a stock sale is, is usually a good thing. Um, the cons are that you're basically swallowing this entire company and you may be walking into historical liabilities that you aren't aware of and that you're automatically just taking on. Now, some of that potentially you can carve out with some negotiation and some uh, uh, tax clause negotiation at the outset, but just be aware that you are acquiring those historical liabilities. Um, the, the last point was uh, very specific to leasing companies, but or any companies that have a financial arm where they may be selling off commercial paper. Um, if, you're, if you're selling off commercial paper uh, of a lease that you are otherwise just servicing, uh, so maybe you don't have that asset anymore, uh, what does that do when someone comes and, and acquires uh, the company that you own, the, the commercial paper, does that commercial paper permit the reassignment uh, to, to the purchaser? And will the, is the buyer going to be willing to agree to basically the servicing obligations? Um, just something to keep in mind. So really in the context of M&A, where most of our questions and most of our liabilities come from is instances where we're talking about asset sales. So sales tax events, Breen talked about these transfer taxes. When you're executing a, a, an asset sale, that's where the tax is going to be triggered. So the first question is, are we selling a piece of property or, or is what we're selling going to incur sales tax? If it's tangible personal property, general rule is yes, that's going to be subject to sales tax. But wait, are there exemptions that apply? And we've, we've touched on the big ones, release, resale exemptions, exempt users, uh, exempt property, inventory, et cetera. But here's where I wanna talk about some of the exceptions. So touched on this earlier, uh, state of Colorado has an across the board manufacturing exemption. So a, you're acquiring a company that has some manufacturing equipment and historically they have taken a manufacturing exemption on this. It, the property is located in Colorado. Let's stay, let, let's, for purposes of this example, let's say it's in Denver. At the state level, uh, I believe Colorado's state level tax is roughly four to five percent, or is it 2.9 percent? Um, maybe 2.9 percent, that is going to be exempt. But where Colorado, any of us that have dealt on the indirect side and dealt with the localities know is you have a county, you have a city, you have a municipality, you have a water reclamation, you have all these local taxes that come into play, many of which are home rule authorities. The question that you have to address is, okay, it's exempt at the state level, but is it at the, at the local level? And I can tell you, um, at least in the past, I haven't looked at this uh, in the last year, but historically, some of the Colorado locals have not uh, granted that manufacturing exemption. So you may be exempt at the state level, but not at the local level. Beware of that as you're transferring that type of equipment, either uh, selling it or acquiring it. Another common example is uh, for those companies that are leasing equipment. Typically, the release certificate will work when you're releasing equipment. You purchase the equipment for subsequent release to another. 
uh, and most states exempt that similar to a resale exemption. Three, uh, uh, three carve outs here, but there's really uh, two additional ones as well. Um, Illinois, you gotta be wary of that the lessor is actually the user of that equipment. So there's a use tax. So that release certificate's not going to, to work in Illinois. Same exact rule with Maine and a very similar rule in California as well, especially in the, in the context of, of mobile transportation equipment. Uh, Hawaii is identified here because they have a wholesaler's tax. And with that in mind, we could also throw in uh, the Washington B&O as well. Uh, uh, B&O is just uh, another problem tax anytime you're involved. I, I shouldn't say problem, but just a tax to be aware of anytime you're involved with M&A activity because you are going to uh, be subject to the wholesaling uh, business and occupation tax in Washington, even if you may in fact be exempt from the retailing business occupation tax. So we've talked about practical issues with the title property. Um, we, we said the advantage of a stock sale when disposing of this titled property is you can avoid some of those issues of, of odometer readings, re-registering at the DMV. But really another, um, uh, another significant cost with asset sales and titled property is there's about 20 to 25 states that impose basically a motor vehicle excise tax. So it's carved out of its sales tax. And instead of um, imposing the tax on a sale or transfer of a motor vehicle, which would otherwise likely adopt the resale exemption, uh, these 25 states or so impose a tax on the retitling or the reissuance of a title. So you're not gonna be able to uh, take advantage of that resale certificate when you're retitling the vehicle. Now, if this does in fact impact your business, particularly if you're a leasing company or if you just have a number of titled property that you're otherwise disposing of or acquiring, whether it's an internal transfer, external transfer, whatever the case may be, one of uh, the planning opportunities around this would be the creation of a, a, a titling trust where rather than selling the actual title on the motor vehicle, you are selling the interest in that property and states have generally um, uh, been willing to accept that there would be no transfer taxes on that, on that transfer of intangible interest. We talked about successor liability. So bulk sale notifications and tax clearance. I do have a question for the other two panelists, but I'll explain what this is initially. So, um, in the event that there is going to be a, 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 some kind of transaction triggering sales tax, many states, if not all states, and many jurisdictions at least require the filing of a bulk sale notification. And what this does is the parties uh, generally fill out some kind of application or form which notifies the jurisdiction that this sale is in fact occurring, and it permits this open period for the jurisdiction to either review the potential liabilities of the selling company uh, for purposes of the buyer being affirmed that the, the tax, all tax liabilities that are due are, are, are paid for and there's no outstanding liabilities. And then what generally happens is the jurisdiction will A, either audit the company, uh, B, issue a tax clearance letter, which gives the buyer satisfaction that there's no outstanding tax liabilities, or see in some instances, there will be uh, a letter from the jurisdiction that says, hey, we're gonna audit. We're not gonna be able to perform any kind of audit or review prior to the time of sale. So we're asking you to withhold X amount from the purchase price to set aside for any potential liabilities that may come from this. Uh, what you really need to do or pay particular attention to if you're filing these bulk sale notifications you need to pay specific attention to the rules around those bulk sales and the, specifically the timing associated with it. Um, so two, uh, recently we've had some clients that have had issues in Cook County because they have in fact filed the bulk sale notification, but they didn't file it. I believe Cook County requires you to file it, uh, I wanna say 60 days before the date of sale. And there's plenty of instances where maybe you don't know 60 days before the date of sale whether there's going to be an acquisition. You, this may be a quick deal where you find out you're going to do an acquisition 45 days out. 
So you say, okay, I'm going to go to Cook County. I'm going to file this bulk sale notice, even though it's 45 days out, because we just learned of this, of this acquisition. Well, Cook County and other jurisdictions will take the position that if you don't follow the rules, basically that's a non-issue, or, or I should say it's a non-filing of a, of a bulk sale notification. And what this often leads to is significant audits and then back taxes. And then you have a buyer and a seller potentially jointly and severally liable for any liability. So from a buyer's perspective, I'd say that's the worst case scenario. Uh, and, and where I'm going with this for the other, um, for Maryland and Breen is, you know, oftentimes, even though there's this requirement, a lot of companies don't file these bulk sale notifications because really what this does is alert the jurisdiction to, um, to potential tax liabilities and, and audit behavior. So um, just in your experience, uh, what has your been ex experience been with your clients in, in filing these types of notifications with the jurisdictions beforehand? Well, I, I will say the bigger issue in the prior life of being in a corporation was to explain to the legal department, who was generally the group that was drafting the sales agreements, or to the outside counsel that the legal department had hired to draft the sales agreements, as well as to the federal group, that you really had to file these because their concept always was there's reps and warranties in the agreement. And if in fact there's a liability that comes down, you know, down the pike sometime later after the sale, we'll go under the reps and warranties. And there's sometime a holdback under reps and warranties. It's generally not enough to cover the tax. So the hardest part as an in-house person, I think, is to educate your people that you really have to file these. Um, most of the sales that I have been involved in the bulk sales notices have been filed and monies have been, if, if it's the seller, monies have been held back from the purchase price to see if in fact it will cover some of the tax liability. There's a, there are the, the, uh, the horrors cases are out of Missouri where people have been held to have liability for three or four sales back because bulk sales notices weren't be fired, so, filed. So the harder thing I think is to educate your own internal people that you have to do this. Yeah, I mean, I would say I've definitely seen situations um, where a lot of times it's not necessarily that it's not filed, but it's just it's the last thing on the checklist. It's not of extreme importance. It's not a priority. And so it's filed late or it's filed days before the sale is supposed to close, the deal is supposed to close. And so we always get questions um, from like our business group, our business finance group saying, well, how can we get we need to get this deal done? How do we get this done? We just filed this bulk sale, um, and the in and you generally the cities and the the different jurisdictions have a certain amount of time they have to respond to you by. Um, so a lot of times, what I hear from um, whether it be an in-house counsel or one of the deal attorneys is, well, it's fine because as Marilyn said, we have an indemnity in the contract, and it doesn't matter we're we're covered, and we'll so like if that's a position they're going to take, then like boots and suspenders, I'm, I, I generally will recommend that they hold something back in escrow, try to estimate, overestimate what the potential exposure could be. Because what I try to um, explain or convey is that at the end of the day, um, the department really doesn't care what kind of indemnity you have with the other party. They just want, you're going to be liable for it. If you're the buyer, you're going to be liable. They don't care if it was really the sellers and that they didn't get back to you on time. If the sale closes, if this deal closes and you did not, it, it, you're going to be on the hook for it. You're going to be on the hook for the money. So, um, you definitely need to have, you need to be protected. And if they feel comfortable moving forward with the, you know, relying on the indemnity and maybe an escrow setup. I just generally like to impart the potential ramifications of that. And usually what gets our attention, especially if you're dealing with, you know, a larger corporation is the concept of responsible officer on the indirect side. Um, the fact that one of the officers of their company could potentially be held personally liable for this, um, which is not something that, um, which is something that sometimes not everyone is actually well aware of because you're, again, our world so much of the time is consumed with, the direct with income tax, corporate income tax issues, um, which responsible officer is just not a concept there, right? So um, a lot of times that sometimes that will get their attention uh, because that's the last thing anybody wants <laughs> is an officer of their company getting a letter saying that they potentially are going to be, you know, 
personally liable for an outstanding trust tax, trust fund tax. Yeah, and point made with with the Cook County examples that I mentioned earlier, where they where the buyer didn't follow the 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 specific notification period. Um, the county's going after them for the past seven years because that's the statute of limitations in Cook County, and not only that, they're going after them for you know two prior owners ago. So. Here is this, and, and the tax at issue there is this parking lot tax, which no one seemed to even know about until two years ago. And they're going back seven years on these on these parties, um, where now you have to produce books and records and documentation about who was parking in this parking lot when you're just not going to have those records from two sales ago. The other thing, while most of the people on this call may not, on this webinar may not be impacted by Wayfair. In the Wayfair world, without filing bulk sales because of economic nexus, for want of a better way to describe it, in the thresholds, you're going to see a lot more, I think, of states going after people for prior liabilities. So it's it's something to be aware of. So, so why does this matter? Why are we talking about sales tax on the transaction? Uh, Again, sales tax matters because it's such a larger base. So here's just a quick example. Unfortunately, it's using the old uh, federal and state tax rates. But just under this, if if uh, we're looking at a $100 million asset deal and the basis is $90 million, uh, and then of that purchase price, $50 million is allocated to tangible personal property that's subject to sales tax, well, what are the results? On the income tax, we only have the $10 million uh, gain uh, multiplied by a 40% rate, we get to 4 million. But then even on the sales tax side, because we have such a larger base that we have to be cognizant and responsible for from a tax perspective, even though it's a much lower rate at 8%, we're still getting to the same place of 4 million. So this is why it matters because even though the rates are low, the, ba uh, the, the base is large. And that's just another um, piece to remind other people that are part of this deal team uh, it, it, they may look at it and say, oh, well, sales tax isn't an issue. I'm dealing with a six to seven percent rate. Well, it is an issue because the base is so much larger. So when we're talking about exemptions, key questions that you need to be asking is who is the buyer? Are they an exempt entity? Are, you know, are you dealing with a company that maybe they have a federal contract and they, they fall under a, a federal exemption? Uh, what is the property that's being sold? We know that we, what Breen said, we can eliminate intangibles, real estate, um, we're going to focus primarily on tangible personal property that's subject to tax. Now, we do know that there's going to be some exceptions outside of tangible personal property, but that's, that's the general rule, and these are the questions you want to ask as you're um, figuring out what is and is not subject to tax. Um, how will the buyer be using what's being purchased? Um, in the context of vehicles, again, if you're selling a number of vehicles, or um, leasing a number of vehicles, are they going to be IRP uh, international registration plated, which means these are vehicles that are used to cross state lines and for which many uh, states uh, offer uh, uh, interstate exemption for. Manufacturing equipment or resale, are you, is this a deal with another re uh, retailer where much of what's being sold is inventory that um, you can claim the resale exemption? Uh, we talked a little bit about the nature of the transaction and also the I isolated and occasional exemption. And Marilyn mentioned this earlier, but uh, typically the rule is uh, you might be able to exempt much of the deal by claiming the occasional casual or isolated sales tax exemption, which basically says if you are in a single event, if you're selling um, uh, the entire operating assets of a business or even in, in some cases like Texas, a separate identical segment of that business, you may be able to claim or likely be able to claim the occasional casual or isolated sale exemption for that for that sale of TPP. Uh, just want you to be aware of though, we mentioned the California rule where if you, um, if you have the retailer's permit in California, you're not gonna be able to claim this and also the, the three strike rule. And we have seen California aggressively pursue this both recently and in the past. Uh, Kentucky also has this three strike rule. So if you're a business that maybe have three different segments or, or a handful of different segments and you have consummated three different asset deals in the last three or four years, Kentucky may get a hold of this and say, hey, we're not gonna permit you to claim that isolated sale exemption anymore because it appears based on your activity that you are in the business of selling 
businesses. Other possible exemptions that we talked about, resale, um, we've talked about that a few times. Manufacturing, again, I, we talked about the Colorado exemption, but you also have to focus, it, it's not as simple as saying, okay, this is used in the manufacturing process, uh, therefore it's exempt. We know that the manu as, as sales tax professionals, the manufacturing exemption is not always straightforward. Um, when does that process begin and end uh, for example, you have a forklift. Some states may view that forklift that you're acquiring as being used in the manufacturing exemption when it's used to move pallets from the truck, uh, when it, from the loading dock to the first uh, step in the assembly line of assembling a widget. Um, other states may look at it and say, nope, that equipment has to be used specifically within that manufacturing process. So as an example, that forklift, which is only carrying widgets from the loading dock to the assembly line and maybe a finished widget from the end of the assembly line to the loading dock, that wouldn't qualify because it's not actually being used in the process to transform or to change an ingredient that's used in the manufacturing process. So I uh, just want to make you aware that if you are acquiring manufacturing equipment, just make sure that that exemption was uh, properly claimed in the states. Um, another hot topic in, in indirect is just the electronically uh, electronic delivery of software, SaaS products. Is that subject to sale and uh, sub subject to sales tax in the state that it's located, um, or where the users? I should say where the users are uh, that are using this property. I want to get to our last polling question before we talk about the sale preparation steps. All right, so we're just gonna gauge some interest out there of the attendees. Um, what impact do you anticipate the current business environment to have on, on mergers and acquisitions? Uh, we were already acquired or are acquiring another company. Lots of activity, it's coming, no impact or unsure. All right, end this and sharing the results. So many of you think that the activity is still coming. So uh, like I said, we've been in, in an environment, a business environment where the M&A community has been really hot, a lot of acquisitions, divestitures, and it looks like even in the current business environment where there's a lot of uncertainty, a lot of us think it's still coming. And uh, uh, I tend to agree with, with that answer. I don't know if any of the Well, other... if you look at, you know, David, if you look at 2008, 2009 as any um indication if we were to follow that then i that is absolutely correct because there were if you look at the amount of um the the, the amount of activity and deals that happened during that time period there were a lot um and i think like if you use that as any sort of indicator as to what we what what it potentially lies ahead i think then that is the right answer I, I agree. I think what you're going to see is you have some industries where there are some players in the industry that are struggling and we're struggling even before March or February or March of this year. And you have some of the stronger players that see the ability to to bulk up on some of some things, reserves or if, if you're in the oil industry, reserves or things along those lines. So I think you're going to see some mergers or you're going to see some acquisitions. I don't think you maybe see mergers as much as you're going to see outright acquisitions. Acquisitions, yeah. So we got about 10 minutes left. We're going to take that time on just talking about the sale prep steps. And, uh, you know, the purpose of this section was really to, uh, at least in my experience, offer some of the ex uh, experiences that, that I witnessed and, and lived through uh, during the, the pretty large um, sale of, G of GE Capital. So the sale comes down and, and here's what needs to happen is you need to take a step right away. You have to be proactive in setting this up. And what I witnessed uh, 
and it's it, they just did a, a wonderful job is the leadership at Capital. I mean, it, it's tough when you make an announcement to your entire workforce, which is, was about 40,000 employees, and you say, okay, we're going to go through this ginormous sale, which is $2 billion. Um, many of you, you won't be employed at GE Capital at the end of this. Many of you may be fired. Many of you may not have a job, but oh, by the way, we need you to do the work to get this sale done. So just a very odd time. Uh, leadership really needs to step up and you just need to step. It, it was almost like maybe we didn't have enough time to think about this. We just got going right away because the management came in and said, okay, here's what we do. And we set up different teams. We set up a research team. We set up a deal team that was gonna be responsible for negotiating the tax provisions. We set up an audit team to review uh, to, to get our audits together. We got an SOP team, a standard operating procedures team together to make sure all our procedures were documented. And then um, we had an audit team that was responsible for monitoring all the sales tax remittances for the transfer taxes, being sure that we were able to walk through that calculation in the event that the auditors, uh, you know, came knocking three or four years down the line. Did we document that well enough? So if you weren't sitting in that position, but someone else still at, you know, what the skeletons of GE Capital, if, if someone was still at that selling business was, could they walk through the steps and get the auditors through those? Um, why is it necessary? We know that sales tax can kill deals. Uh, we showed that example of why it matters, uh, low rate, but large, large base. And then we're going to talk a little bit about dil diligence and some of the restructuring. So from a sell side due diligence, here's the things that you need to think about is who's gonna be responsible for the filings, both on the transfer tax and also post-sale. Is, is there gonna be any kind of transition service agreement where maybe the seller's still responsible for filing some of those returns after the fact? Um, what are the filings? Where are you filing? What jurisdictions, state, federal? Is there a third party compliance provider that is uh, filing your returns? Um, are you quarterly in some states and, or, or monthly in others? Like, is all that laid out uh, and are you able to share that with the buyer? In the past, have you conducted any nexus studies? Maybe you're a company that doesn't have uh, presence everywhere in the United States. Is there a reason why uh, you aren't filing in certain jurisdictions? And, and along those lines is what are your tax determinations? Um, why did you make the decisions to tax certain transactions in the past versus uh, exempt others? Uh, what is your documentation for exempting those sales? What is your documentation for why you're taxing or exempting the actual sale of assets to the buyer? And wh why some of this is important from a sell side, getting back to the escrow uh, discussions, is because if your books and records are in really good working order, when you go to sell to sell those assets, that's just going to ultimately have a favorable effect on the amount of money that you possibly need to set aside in escrow to cover some of these liabilities that may come up from audit determinations in the future. So from a sell side perspective, you may think, oh, it's just the buyer's responsibility. They're going to have to deal with all this mess when we're done. We're getting rid of the assets and we're going to be done with it. Well, from a fiscal perspective, you want to put yourself in the best possible light to minimize you know, any kind of uh, distractions or hiccups as you close the deal and also minimize the amount that you have to throw in into escrow. Uh, similarly, uh, do you have any liabilities booked from an audit perspective? And, and similarly, what's your audit history? Uh, are you able to share that with the buyer to give them some assurances uh, in certain states that maybe in the, in the past they've had some uh, audit heartburn? From the buy side, you need to develop a checklist of SALT issues. Uh, the, the big one that comes to mind is, is your acquisition of this company going to expand your presence? And are you going to have filings in new jurisdictions that you may have otherwise not had? Uh, are you getting into maybe a new line of business? Maybe you're acquiring a company that did have a small leasing portfolio and you're uh, in the past have just been a, a, a retailer and now you also all of a sudden have a leasing portfolio. What are the steps that you need to take to prepare for the, uh, the operational aspects and also the, the tax technical perspectives of, of getting into a new business. Um, pay particular attention to aggressive tax planning strategies and you should be asking for all memorandums of you know, any stra uh, strategies that you see that may be aggressive or uh, that, they, that the selling company has taken in the past. You wanna get as much documentation 
as you can. And then start making a list of your exposure and start at the top and work your way down. Those are states that you want to bring up at the table when you're negotiating with this party and maybe in an attempt to lower the, um, lower the purchase price of the deal and of the assets or alternatively of uh, uh, setting aside money to handle potential exposure and liabilities down the, step, down the road. Um, really the action steps on this, uh, we talked about uh, performing a nexus study. Are you gonna increase your presence? Um, taxability determinations. The seller, if they were a retailer or a lessor, uh, hopefully has some kind of matrix, matrix or matrices that they have used, which tracks their logic on why they are taxing and not taxing certain determinations. Ask for that, and you need to have a team that's ready to go to review those determinations and check those against the law to make sure that their, their determinations were correct. Um, exemption certificates, contracts, titles, any type of documentation that has to be on the buyer's mind when they're acquiring a company, you want the history of that asset, especially if it's a if it's a motor vehicle or really whatever the asset is. You want the entire history of that asset. Uh, when was it sold or when was it acquired? When what when was the lease inception? Do you have the lease agreement? Whatever is relevant to that, um, especially titles, you want all copies of titles. Uh, VDAs is, you know, potentially is there uh, an opportunity now that you're taking over this company where you want to approach a jurisdiction because you are increasing uh, nexus or, or maybe acquiring some presence in states that you didn't otherwise have. Is it a prime opportunity to look into uh, filing a voluntary disclosure agreement? Contract negotiation. So again, um, setting aside, you know, having a team members responsible specifically for those contract negotiations in the, in the purchase and sales agreement. What is the tax indemnity language? You know, you want it to be include, broad enough to include indirect taxes. This is again where sometimes the income tax side of things forgets about the, the indirect side. And you want to make sure that the indemnity locate, uh, language not only identifies sales tax, but gross receipts tax, excise tax, um, real estate tax, any type of um, indirect side. If it's an international company, make sure that uh, value added tax is included in that. And uh, also make sure you understand what materiality is when it comes to audit liabilities and who's gonna bear those responsibilities. Post-close tax filings. Um, that's another provision that you want to ensure that someone is taking ownership of. Is it gonna be the buyers? Uh, are they going to take over the, the post-tax filings or is it going to be the seller? More than likely, there's going to have to be some transitional straddle period where the seller is assisting with that. It just, uh, depending on the size of the transaction, could cause a lot of complexity if all of a sudden the buyer on day one of, of taking over these assets is, is responsible for filing compliance. Uh, but with that, even though it's an asset sale, are you going to take some of the employees of that former company, or not of the former company, of the selling company? Because those are the people that may understand that background of what was, uh, of the decisions that was made in the filing and the compliance that may be necessary to continue operations for the buyer. So when we look at successor liability uh, on the sale of a business, the general income tax rule is income tax liabilities aren't going to follow with the purchase of the assets. But with the general sales tax rule, sales tax liabilities will follow the, pur will follow the purchase of substantially all the assets of the business. So as a buyer, when you're acquiring those assets, just be mindful of the fact that you may have past uh, sales tax liability or, or liability for past periods. And that may be something that you want to address with the negotiations. Um, we talked about bulk sale. We talked about reserves. Reserves, uh, most definitely as a buyer, you want to be asking for that information, see what they reserve for. Is that tied to specific audit history with a particular jurisdiction? ask as much as you can uh, about that to make sure that you understand the issues and maybe some of the uh, black holes that the seller had in the past. Uh, Post-closing steps, uh, last slide. We talked about transition services agreement. I think this is a particularly good idea for the buyer. Enter into those transition service agreements if you're not going to be acquiring any of the employees of the sellers. 
this is going to permit your company an opportunity to come up to speed by learning from those individuals that were responsible for the compliance, audit defense, whatever the case may be of that selling company. Now, you may not have that opportunity. Those employees may not be around. They may have, uh, unfortunately, there may be nothing left with the seller. They found new jobs. Um, but to the extent that's possible, as a buyer, I think that's a, a, that's a positive step to enter into those transition service agreements to handle filings, audit defense, et cetera. Yeah, and just more generally too, this and this applies on both the direct and indirect side, TSAs are extremely important because it delineates who's responsible for what. So a lot of times you'll have a situation where the, the seller will still be responsible for a lag period after for those filings um, because of the historical knowledge that they have. Um, so, I mean, TSAs in general are just, um, and particularly, you know, most of the people, most of who is on here are dealing in industries and would be participating in sales of nature that you would most definitely have a TSA, but um, those, those are extremely important. Yeah, and the last two, uh, we already mentioned these points, but just refresh exemption certificates. Those certificates do go bad. So upon acquiring these assets, if any exemptions uh, are being claimed, um, you know, if, if you are a leasing company or a retailer, you've sold these assets or you have equipment on your books where you're claiming an exemption, just take a second look at those and make sure that they're properly being claimed and that they're up to date. So just a reminder, put that slide back up there. Uh, those of you who need CPA credit, please stick around and complete the survey that's gonna should be automatically pop up at the end of this webinar. And on behalf of Breen and David and myself, I thank you guys very much for taking two hours out of your day to hang out with us. We wish we could have done it in person, but maybe six months from now, I don't know. So thanks everyone. Yeah, thanks so much.